You know the flying V? That was a Mighty Ducks hockey maneuver. It's not really supposed to be what your equalizer looks like. Hey guys, I am Nova. Welcome to another video. It's going to be a bit of a tutorial of sorts today. I've had a community member asking me more recently uh, about audio processing for their microphone, and I've certainly had a lot of people ask me about it in the past as well. And while I am by no means an expert and am constantly learning myself as I continue to uh, watch videos on actual experts and read as much as I can uh, to learn the the secret hidden art of making your uh, your voice and your audio sound better for my own purposes. I thought I'd maybe do a bit of a video here to uh, to pass on what I do know because it's relatively rudimentary stuff. It's not super complicated, and uh, and perhaps hopefully the way that I describe it maybe will be uh, more salient for those who are looking for this kind of information instead of the myriad of videos that are already out there on this topic exactly. Uh, so without further ado, let's hop right in. We don't need to be looking at my ugly mug today. We can actually go on over here and, uh, and see my DAW of choice, which is Adobe Audition. Uh, the DAW, or the DAW, as you probably hear it called most often, is, uh, is simply just a piece of software that's going to be uh, the vehicle for allowing you to do your audio processing. Um, in a weird way, you could almost look like look at this like it was a software version of a hardware mixer uh, that some of you might be familiar with. Like a lot of live streamers might use, you know, a Behringer mixer or Yamaha or or uh, or similar setups in that regard. I used to use an Allen and Heath myself, and this is kind of just a uh, a more uh, robust software version of that that can obviously do a few more things. Um, than uh, just a mixer on its own. Now, the first thing before we even start talking about any of the processing that you're seeing uh, going on here on the left-hand side of the screen is I want to talk to you about uh, getting your microphone in the right position and, uh, and setting your gain at the right level going in. The first step. Uh, lots of people have their microphone volume too loud or too quiet when they first start their uh, their journey in audio, uh, and that can lead to all sorts of issues in different ways depending on which direction you had gone there. Uh, in the another video that I had just done not too too long ago about choosing uh, a microphone for your application, we talked a little bit about microphone etiquette in there, and so if you didn't see that already, maybe go and check that section of that video out, but the long short of it is the distance that you want to be from your microphone, and this is pretty much any microphone type that you'd be using, with very few exceptions, if you made the like, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the surfer uh, hand gesture, the, the, uh, so I do have a camera, you know, I, I could, do this thing, if you did this, and despite the fact that, you know, I have larger hands than most of you, if you did that, and between your mouth and the microphone, congratulations, you did the thing. Uh, that's more or less a good distance, and the only reason that you go further or closer than that would be, uh, further away would really only be if you were having some boominess issues in the microphone, uh, perhaps, um, or something else, like maybe you were in a very well-treated room and you were trying to do more conversational stuff for voiceover that didn't want to sound like a voice that was right in your ears and more part of a room. Uh, and then if you're getting closer, you're going to use that proximity effect uh, to, to make the sound a little bit more full and rich and right in the ears and bassier and all that other stuff. Uh, and if you get really close to a microphone, uh, then that's kind of what that is. And that's what it's called, by the way, the proximity effect. It's the proximity to the microphone and the closer you get um, you know, the, the tonal quality of the bass and everything tends to change. With few exceptions, there might be a couple microphones that are less, uh, sensitive to that kind of thing, but in general, that's how that works. And it's oftentimes while you'll see, so, why you will see some people basically eating their microphone, because they do want to have that, that sound, and it's kind of associated with a, a radio, almost, sound, right? So, where do you want your audio to be coming in? Like your first stage, your your audio's levels coming in. 
Well, again, that depends, I suppose, a little bit on your individual situation, but for the most part, I like to have my audio, personally, coming in at somewhere between minus 16 and, or minus, let's say, minus 18 and minus 12 dB. And you can see the input here on the side, uh, and the output, of course, but the input is, is right around minus 18 to minus 12-ish, um, depending on how loud I'm talking, and that's where I like it to be. Any louder than that, and odds are I'm picking up more of the room than I need to, um, or I'm going to uh, be providing just a little bit too much volume at the source, and, uh, and it won't be as clear, I, I guess, as my experience. For my voice, this is not for everyone's, uh, but it gives you some headroom as well to work with processing, uh, and, uh, and allows you to, uh, to turn some other things up in, in ways, uh, further down the road and not be clipping out like crazy or being super high volume when you don't need to be. And that's a, so that's a good starting point. Somewhere between minus 18 and minus 12 is not awful, uh, and, uh, and probably where you should be shooting for, uh, just for your normal speech. Now, if you're, let's say you were doing... Uh, voiceover and you knew that it, or you were singing and you knew at some point that you were going to be getting real loud then the better thing to do is to uh is to tune that that input volume to that most loud part do a little demo for yourself and dial in the uh the audio for that so that you're not dialing it in for uh, for quieter speech or singing and then when the time comes when you're you know, you're putting on your Whitney Houston, uh, that all of a sudden you're peeking the microphone out and, uh, and blowing out the audio and, 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 uh, and having it sound terrible. So you've set your microphone levels. You've gotten in that minus 18 to minus 12 kind of zone. You're at the right distance from your microphone to get that, uh, that sound and, uh, and to get as much of your room out of the audio as possible. And now you're talking about actual processing. So what do we start with? In the world of live streaming or, or almost any kind of recording short of perhaps singing where you are, and I don't even know, I don't personally sing, obviously, uh, so maybe people do use some sort of gating, but uh, all the same, gating is usually my first step in my own personal chain and that of many others, and that helps keep the room noise out of the microphone audio whenever you're not talking or you're in between words, etc., etc., and you don't necessarily want to hear fans or fish tanks or sirens when the cops are coming to get you, etc., etc., uh, and while you might hear all these things when you're talking, because the gate will be open when your voice pushes the gate open, uh, when you're not talking, you won't hear it in the background. And that's kind of what the thing is, is all about. Depending on what style of gating you're doing, you might see two different things. And this might depend on the DAW you're using or just the plugin that you're using. Uh, in Audition, the Dynamics Processing is what I use. Uh, and I'll explain a bit why, but in general, I'm just going to explain the loose concept of a gate uh, in terms of setting it. What you want to do is, ideally, you want to, uh, if you can have a visual aid of this of some kind, it's even better, but you want to be able to cut the audio off at a spot where you're getting the room audio mostly gone or entirely gone when you're not talking, while also not gating so far up in terms of volume that you accidentally start cutting off uh, the beginnings of words, you know, softer sounds like an H or a D, uh, things of that nature that might get cut off uh, at the beginning of words if you are not uh, careful where you're gating. And you might actually have examples of this if you were ever talking to people on Discord and they had their, you know, there's a gate on Discord specifically and sometimes people will cut out in between words or at the beginnings of the words and, and whatnot and that tends to be uh, because of the gate being set too high and, you know, the, the beginnings of their words are not loud enough to open the gate for you to hear everything and that's the result. So if I stop talking entirely, which is a difficult thing for me to do, admittedly, you will see on this visualization, you will see the audio in the room, more or less. Uh, and that's like the absolute floor of the audio in my room with the microphone input volume that I currently have. So I'm just going to stop talking, and you can see what that looks like.
So you can see that there is somewhere around a noise floor around minus 60 dB, and that's pretty quiet. Uh, it's a little louder than it used to be because I had my uh, I had changed recently my microphone positioning and whatnot, and I was I had to increase my my input uh, volume personally uh, for some different voiceover work that I was doing. But all the same, that's about where you would want it to be anyway. The gating for almost any audio is going to fall somewhere between minus 70 and minus 60, with some people, for whatever reason that you might need it, could go as high as minus 50, and it's all to taste. If you really have a loud room and you're live streaming, and you know, you know that when you're talking, they're going to hear the background and that's fine, but you really don't want them to hear anything else, maybe it's keyboard strokes and whatnot, and there's no other place for you to put your microphone to get it away from the keyboard, then maybe you have to push that up a little bit more. But in general, minus 70 to minus 60 is where most gates are going to be. Now, if you look at mine, you can see that it's not, it's not a, a hard cutoff point. Right? It's not a straight line at minus 70. So it's not that it lets all the audio in and then at minus 70 it's done. And that's just because this is a slightly different and, and slightly more precise gate where it will do some compression instead of completely gating um, from wherever points I set it. So at minus 50 I start, uh, I start to attenuate is the fancy word for it all the way down to minus 70 where it just cuts it off entirely. And what that allows me to do is help ensure that in between words or the very beginnings of words don't get cut off when I am just uh, speaking normally. Uh, that's all that is. You can totally accomplish that with just a hard gate where you say at minus, let's say 60, I don't want anything to come in uh, below that and that's fine. But for me, this was just a more helpful thing uh, to do. So your gate might look a little different. It could just literally be a little knob that says, all right, uh, where do you want the volume to stop? Uh, to stop coming in and then you could just set it, but that's the idea a gate is to simply say Below this nothing gets in and above it. I'll let that volume through and that's all that does So you can set your gate and now at this point You're at least not hearing the room nearly as much. So what's the next step? Well for me, I have some different uh, stuff here than most people would have perhaps um, I have isotope uh, stuff uh, for my processing. So I have a, a mouth declicker and that just helps get rid of some of the uh, mouth sounds that can happen. Uh, and you can have other declickers and whatnot approximate this, but for me, uh, this was the one that worked the best. Uh, and you do not need to have it really most of the time. It's just a nice additive thing. So don't worry too much about that. The next part that you should really be considering is a high pass filter. Yay! Now, this is something that you might have already heard about several times as well, other than a gate, a high pass filter. Uh, and if not, well, I'll explain a little bit about what it is anyway. This thing might actually be on an interface that you already have, that your microphone is plugged into, unless, of course, you're using a USB microphone. Uh, it could be on a mixer, it could be on just a regular interface of any kind. Uh, and what it does, even though it's, it's kind of deceiving, but the high pass filter cuts off the low, low, low frequencies of the audio coming in. Why would you want to do that? Well, when you're speaking into the microphone and you've got the room around you and whatnot, there's all sorts of stuff going on um, in, the, in that, that, uh, that audio that isn't specifically your voice. It might be a little bit of your voice uh, here and there, but in general, you're getting more of stuff like rumble in the room, your voice is reverberating off of walls, you know, bass is building up in the corners of the room, your microphone uh, could be vibrating a bit, or the uh, there could be vibrations in the microphone arm, or whatever the microphone is attached to, etc, etc. That's kind of all this, uh, this extra crap that we don't really want in our audio, it doesn't add anything, and it just kind of muddies, makes it sound muddier. So if I uh, were to uh, just give you an example uh, of this, I can actually, for, for my high pass filter, I can solo this so that you guys can hear, if I were to keep talking, kind of what it's cutting out. And you might not hear it all that easily, depending on your headphones or how good your ears are and whatnot, but you probably should hear it. So I'll solo this and you can hear, I'll keep talking about nonsense. You should be able to hear 
what that is like. If you even, you probably didn't even understand what it said there, if that worked as it was supposed to anyway. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is what is getting removed there. So how do we set it? What do we want to do? Well, again, depending on the kind of, uh, um, of methodology for high pass filter, if it's on your interface, odds are it's a switch. And depending on your interface or whatever your microphone is plugged into, if it has a high pass filter, it could be at different places. A lot of them are at 80 hertz, and then it's rolled off from 80 hertz, and a roll off just means like that, like what this looks like. It's like a hill. It's rolling off the hill. It's not just a straight line down. It's rolling. It's rolling off nice and uh, nice and easy. Uh, yeah. What do you want to set it at? Well. You're going to hear this a lot today. Depends on you. Depends on the voice. Depends on the microphone. Depends on the room. And the combination of all of these things. But the general rule of thumb that I follow is somewhere between the cutoff points of 80 and 50 hertz. And I almost always use, if it's an option, which in most cases it will be for an equalizer. This is all this is, by the way. It's not a special tool. It's just an equalizer that I'm using to do the high pass filtering on at a 12 dB per octave, which all that means is really fancy, is how steep is this slope? So if I increase that to, uh, or decrease, I should say, to 6 dB, you can see how much more of a gentle curve it is. And if I change it to 12, changes the curve, 24 gets sharper, and 48, etc. And uh, the reason why I tend to stick at around 12 is because it just sounds the most natural to me. With any kind of equalization that you do, the gentler the cut or boost, the more natural it tends to sound. And it doesn't sound processed, is I guess the way that I would describe it. Uh, it also allows you to retain as much of the your natural voice as possible, which I guess is more or less saying the same thing, but all the same. For me, in this situation, with this microphone, my voice, this room, the distance, microphone to my voice, all that stuff, 70 hertz, 12 dB per octave is what I use. And you could try it for yourself and see where you might like it. Maybe you need 60. Maybe you need 80. Try it out. I will show you, though, what it sounds like as we move this further up and down. So if I were to, for one, turn it off entirely, Maybe you're hearing a lot more boominess in uh, the audio now. And maybe you're not, because it could depend on the headphones that you're wearing and, and uh, whether or not you're used to hearing, uh, listening for certain frequencies or even being able to hear those frequencies. If I turn it back on, then we now have uh, all of those cut out once again. And if I start to move this forward and I keep talking, you're going to hear it continue to get a little bit more thin and thinner and thinner, and thinner, and then eventually it's just going to sound friggin' weird, and oh my god, what is happening, and suddenly somewhere around here, we're on a 19, you know, 20s radio, and oh god, why, right? Some people cut really, really deep with theirs, we're not going to do that for our application, we're going to stick to uh, 70 and 12, but experiment and see what you prefer for your own situation. Once you've done that, You've now got two of the most important things out of the way. You're getting at least a little bit of the room boom out with that high pass filter. You are cutting the room noise out entirely in between you speaking with that, uh, with that gate. And now we want to try and clean things up a bit more, right? We want to, we want to add a little spice and maybe remove some more problem frequencies as well. Uh, and we do that with more equalization. I run a separate equalizer uh, plugin. Well, I mean, it's the same. It's the same plugin, but a different uh, instance of that plugin. To do that, instead of just running that all on my high pass filter chain, I have a separate one here. Uh, and I'm a fan of doing mostly 
what I call, and I don't know if this is even a technical term, but subtractive equal, uh, equalization, and less about making, uh, making it uh, additive. And in this here, I'm actually doing a bit of both, and I'll explain the reasoning behind that, but generally speaking, in the world of um, loudness and whatnot, and, and what sounds good, the louder something is, the brain just thinks it sounds better. It's a weird thing. It's uh, uh, I don't ask me the science behind that, but that's just kind of how it, how it works. And coincidentally, you can actually make something sound louder by doing subtractive EQ, meaning you're cutting frequencies out. You're reducing the volume of those. And the reason why that can work is because certain frequencies sound louder to us than others at the same volume. Typically, the higher the frequency, the louder it can sound when sustained, for example, um, to my recollection. But uh, when you're cutting on one end of the, of the spectrum, the other end of the spectrum might then sound uh, louder. And so be careful if you're doing a little bit of subtractive and some additive. Some people will say only do one or the other for that reason. Uh, but it's all to your taste. For me, you can see I've got one, two, three... Yeah, well, this one's not really doing anything but helping me flatten this part of the curve out, but three spots that I consider to be trouble spots for me personally in my voice in this room. Um, I have a lot of boom in my voice, as you could probably tell, and so that can cause issues even with me attempting to treat my room uh, a little bit. Uh, that can still happen, and that's what this first one is. So if I solo this for you... Right. Oh my lord, that's awful. Uh, and that's that's really just what you're going to be looking for uh, when you're removing things is the nasty stuff, and it takes time. Uh, I don't I don't have a really sciencey way to tell you about how to be able to look for these frequencies. Um, and everyone has a different method. And some people will poo-poo methods uh, and, and say that that's, you know, don't do that, do it this other way. I'll just tell you what I did uh, for my own. So if, if, I have, uh, if I want to redo my equalization, what I tend to do is I'll pull up a script of some kind and I will record it. And then I will put it into my DAW and then I will do all of this processing to that and listen to it. So that I'm, you know, capable of hearing the differences between everything that I'm, uh, I'm changing. Uh, and uh, when I get to equalization and I want to do this stuff, what I tend to do is I will boost certain frequencies and sweep across the range and see if I can hear problems. Um, you should be able to hear the difference between, um, let's say... Uh, just boosting a frequency and making it louder, and then, and then you'll hear like resonance in the room. It will not sound right. So if I were to uh, take this specific frequency that we had here and boost it in the other direction, uh, then you might hear some of the problems come out in this frequency range um, with the boost, and that might sound obvious because you're thinking, oh well, of course it sounds terrible. You've just completely jacked this one specific range up, but you're not looking to hear like the entire effect of that. You're looking to hear for very specific problems, uh, ringing, um, or, or muddiness or nasaliness and things of that nature. And that's what that's all about. So if you do that and you were to just kind of sweep across while you're listening to your recording, you will hear different, uh, perhaps depending on your situation, you will hear different, uh, trouble spots. You shouldn't really need to cut like a million different things. And if you do, then you're probably overthinking it. Um, and so just be mindful of that. I'm just going to set this back real quick. So, uh, so that's what you would do to look for your problem frequencies. Now, beyond that, if you're using uh, a, a graphic equalizer um, or a parametric equalizer like I'm using here, uh, then there's this, uh, uh, the ability to change the width of your boosts and cuts. So for example here, uh, we've got a Q of four, and that's the width that you're seeing here, 
right? If I were to take that Q and increase it, then you can see it gets much sharper. And if I were to reduce this, it's going to get a lot more broad. And remember what I said about trying to find your happy place of, you know, uh, or, or, or trying not to do things too sharp of a cut when possible to keep that, you know, sounding as natural as you can. That's where this can come into play. There are times where you're going to need to do a, perhaps a very sharp cut to get rid of something very specific, perhaps in your room, uh, in terms of your room noise, and that's fine. Um, but in general, you're going to want to try and keep it a little bit of a natural curve. And you can see over here in this range for me uh, that I'm cutting out here, it's a very gentle curve. And it's because I'm trying to get rid of some of the uh, the nasaliness um, and some of the, there's a, there's, I have a, a nasally reverb sound in my voice that, uh, depending on where the microphone might be, uh, pointing at the time, it'll pick up a bit of that. And this just helps make the audio a bit more clear when I cut this out. Uh, the, for example, this is what it sounds like if we were just to solo this out. This is what it's kind of getting rid of. And, uh, and so on and so forth. Same here. There are, if you were to go and watch other videos on this subject, they'd be, they'd tell you, for example, that the, uh, the low frequencies, you know, upwards of, uh, 200 and so hertz, you're getting rid of that really boomy, deep, deep, deep bass rumble from the room or your voice or the microphone. Then when you get beyond that, you're going to be talking about nasaliness somewhere, I think around, uh, you know, the 500, 600, 400 uh, well, five and six hundred is like a, a nasally kind of a deal. Maybe three to four hundred is like a what people might call a boxy sound uh, to your voice or to your audio. And then if you get up to one k to three k, it can be kind of shrill or sharp uh, that you might want to get rid of, and, and even instances in which you might want to boost that depending on your your voice. Um, beyond three k or to four, maybe even five is some of where the clarity in a voice can can often lie, and so you might need to uh, not touch that oftentimes, or maybe even give it a little bit of a boost. And then beyond that is like in the six, seven, eight K plus is what people would call air, or, or you can add sparkle. All these fancy words to describe things. Uh, for opening up the, uh, the vocal is what I like to call it is, is air or opening the vocal up. If I were to take this and sing, but if I take off the solo and I just turn this off, you'll hear that the, the, that my voice probably sounds darker now, I guess might be the word to use or just not quite as clear. And that's mostly because I have a very, very, uh, resonant deep uh, voice, it's not the deepest voice in the world, but I have a lot of chest resonance, and, uh, and so if I click that on, uh, then it opens it up quite a bit, and it makes it easier for you to understand the words coming out of my mouth, right? Uh, and that's why I have that boosted there. You could, if you wanted to, take that and put it on a third equalizer, uh, if you were doing so much you know, uh, cutting and whatnot here that it would mess with the whole thing if you were to add it. But for me, this is on its own. Nothing is being done out at this range. So I just added the boost there so I didn't run a, a third instance of the equalizer. But that's kind of all there is to it. You can also, of course, boost your low end if you want. I make the joke uh, about the, the flying V kind of deal. Some people will do like a, a, a boosted low and a boosted high and a cut mid and it looks like a the f classic flying V, like you're a mighty duck, if you're old enough to know that reference. Uh, and, uh, and while that might sound good to some people, I don't necessarily recommend that for everyone. Uh, and for a lot, of the, a lot of cases, just cutting your problem f uh, frequencies out to clear your voice up and make it more intelligible, and then just boosting a little bit of the highs, maybe a soft boost in the lows if you need to add back some of the warmth to your voice that you might have lost with a high pass filter or with a cut to get rid of some of your room boom, uh, that's usually more than enough. There are lots of videos, like I said, that will go into equalization in greater depth, but the long short of it is oftentimes less is more, taking away is often better than just adding, 
And, you know, don't be a Mighty Duck. Unless you're trying to be a hockey player. Next up is the compressor. And for some people, they might actually compress before the EQ, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, oftentimes, the difference between compressing before or after your, your equalization uh, is the, the warmth of the sound can often change. So uh, sometimes compressing before you equalize will give you a, um, uh, a, like a, a, a sharper or clearer sound, and then sometimes, or if you put it afterwards, like I like to do, it uh, it makes the audio sound a bit more warm, and uh, that's the preferred sound that I like, and so that's what I use. Uh, again, yours could look different than this, but the the concept is the same, more or less, whether you're using, you know, almost any kind of compressor, really. Uh, and so I'll, I'll loosely go over this stuff and, and hopefully help you understand it a bit better. And the nice thing about this is that we can actually see it working in real time. You know, you can see my, my actual uh, uh, audio coming through the mic here, and then you can see the weight, like the waveform is the word my brain wanted to use. And then you can see this blue line is representative of the compressor and what it's, you know, where it's kicking in and for how long and, and you know, it's, it's coming uh, off and back on, etc, etc. So I'll go over this and uh, hopefully help you guys understand it a bit better uh, and uh, and get what uh, what this is all about. A compressor is really something that for almost any application is, it should be used, uh, but, but for streamers, which I think a lot of you are probably going to be here for streaming and podcasting, it's the difference between, you know, um, uh, the odds of, of killing your end listener uh, with a difference in dynamics, you know, you go from being quite quiet to all of a sudden you're screaming! Um, and if you're not compressing, then the difference in loudness between those two things can be jarring, to say the least, if not quite hurtful to the old ears. Um, compressors can also change the tone of any given audio that they're applied to when this stuff is going on, and you can fiddle around with that tone based on the kind of, uh, compressor that you're using, if you're getting real fancy with it, uh, and, uh, and the settings, of course, that you're using as well will change that sound. The three settings that you're going to see in basically all of yours. You can ignore this limiter section up here. You can uh, technically ignore most of this. This bottom piece and this over here will be the most useful. And what you're going to see in the vast majority of your compressors to some degree uh, is ratio, attack, and release. And then you're also going to have a threshold, usually. Sometimes it will be visually like you have over here. Uh, sometimes it will be a number that, or a, another one of these sliders, or uh, an input. And so you'll have a threshold, a, a ratio, an attack, and a release. So what do these things do? Well, a threshold is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's setting the loudness level that your compressor is going to turn on and start doing things. Below that, it's not going to do anything. Above that, it will start to do its job. So at the top of the screen here, you can see that if I stop talking, the blue line will go all the way to the top, and that will signify that it's not actually activated. See that? And then when I start talking, the louder I get, the deeper it'll push down and compress. Yo! See that? And that's kind of an, I actually peaked my output there, uh, cause I'm not normally that loud. Uh, the, uh, that's, that's a visual representation of what you're looking at there. So the threshold is where do I want my compressor to kick on and start doing things? And so the question might be for, uh, that you might have uh, to ask me would be, oh, well, where do I set mine? And that's one of those things where it might be uh, to, safe to say it's up to you, but I'll give you some general guidelines that I go by personally. Uh, I like to compress not too much, just enough to be to have the compressor be on most of the time, but not not getting real crazy overly compressed. Because if you were to uh, turn the compressor on really hard, it changes the uh, the tone a little too much for my liking, 
Uh, but that's just for me and my voice and my situation. Some people like a really compressed sound. Again, it kind of, for some people, sounds like the radi classic radio sound. So if I were to keep talking and I drop this down, 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 and you'll see that it's compressing more and more and more, and you can see the blue line is now really crushing it, and oh my god, what's happening? Why? Uh, and then we bring it back up, we're seeing that it's doing less and less of that, now it's a little bit more clear, and if I just keep raising it, eventually we'll get to a point where, oh my goodness, we're not even really compressing anymore, right? Um. Whoop. I'm going to hit the right buttons. Believe me, I'm doing it. So that's what that is, is that the threshold is just where your compressor turns on. And for me, I like to do it so that the average is somewhere around a minus 3 dB of compression on the average of my voice when I'm just doing a regular uh, speech and, uh, and not being super loud or super quiet. Uh, and that's just my preference. But if you like a more compressed sound, feel free to jack your compressor through the roof uh, and do as much as you want, or compress even less if that's also what you would like to do. Ratio. Ratio is is kind of how hard the compressor is going to hit your audio once it passes the threshold. For every X number of decibels above your threshold, it will output one decibel. Sounds it's not that complicated, right? So for every, for me, in a three to one ratio, for every three decibels above minus 30 dB, it will output one extra decibel of volume above that minus 30 dB. That's all that means. Uh, what ends up happening to the waveform is it will push the peaks of my waveform down and it will also slightly bring therefore the levels of the uh the audio that's below that up a bit and it kind of squashes the waveform uh and just makes everything a bit more uniform is the idea of the compressor uh and that's what the ratio does is it sets just how strong it's coming in for most vo uh, voice over or vocal stuff for uh, podcasts and things of that nature Two or three to one is fine. I've seen some people use four. I've seen some people use five. I don't know if I would personally recommend going above five for just regular speech. But again, hey, if you think it sounds good, give her. Who am I to stop you? And who is anyone else to stop you? So what does attack and release do? Well, they're kind of related. Uh, but uh, we'll start with attack. Attack is uh, how fast the compressor turns on once your volume passes the threshold, more or less, anyway, is kind of the easy way that I could describe it. Uh, the faster it is, obviously, the faster it works. I know that's a profound statement, but if you were to turn it up and, let's say, really change the attack and make it slower, um, it can change the tone of the compressor a bit. Uh, it's unlikely for my setup that you would hear a lot of that if I were to start turning the attack up and down uh, some people will run for speech, they will run a very fast attack, like 1 millisecond, or even 0.1 millisecond, so just want it on as fast as possible. Um, or, uh, or they'll oftentimes run around 16 milliseconds, is another common number I see. Uh, I tend to end up falling somewhere between, uh, 10 and 30, 40, depending on my, uh, my, my own personal room, microphone, distance, all that stuff, all of those variables, uh, it floats somewhere in there. You can't really mess anything up uh, with the attack. Just listen, keep listening to that audio, see what the, the, it does for, uh, for changing the tone of it, if you're afraid of the tone changing. Uh, but for regular speech, somewhere between anywhere from one millisecond all the way up to maybe even 50, likely fine. With most people, you're going to end up floating somewhere between 10 and 30, I would say, is, is probably a safe bet for where people are going to end up. Uh, but again, do it to your taste. See what you like. See what sounds good with your mic and your voice. Right? Not something to worry too much about. Somewhere in that range. Release is the, uh, the opposite of attack in that it is how long does the compressor stay on before we want it to turn off. You know, how 
how long of a process do we want it to take for the compressor to go on and then off. We don't necessarily always want it to be just immediately off because then it can sound like it's, I guess, pumping your audio. Pump up the jam, pump it up. Uh, so what I mean by that is you'll, you'll definitely hear the compressor turning on and off and it almost sounds like your audio will flutter a bit if your attack and release are set oddly, but it's usually the release is set um, is set too quickly, uh, and that's kind of the result. Um, for me, again, similar. It depends on your speech patterns and and your voice and everything. But for release, somewhere between, depending on you, I can keep saying that I'm a broken record. Somewhere between ten and and maybe even upwards of a hundred milliseconds depending on the type of speech that you're doing or your application, whether you're singing or just a uh, normal uh, speaking voice, etc., or, or casting, it'll all change. But somewhere in that range is fine. And again, it will change the tone to a degree of your audio. So within those ranges, play around a bit, listen to that recorded track that you made that we're doing, you know, listening to our changes that we're making in our processing. And we want to see what uh, you know, what those differences are. That's all you do. Now, if you do have a compressor that has a knee, don't worry about it all that much. That's just kind of like another another bit of uh, of how sharp, I guess, of an angle of attack the compressor is taking to drive down your audio. Um, you can have a soft or a hard knee. A soft knee is a soft curve. A hard knee is more of a of a just a sharp bend. And uh, again, you could, if you had this option, play around with it and see how it changes the sound. It's not going to ruin your sound if you, you know, blow this out of proportion in either direction, but just mess around with it and see what you like. You might also have the ability to, uh, to change the dry and wet level. Dry just means there's you're not hearing any of the processing. Wet is it's passing through all the processing. And sometimes it sounds better to mix just a little bit of the original single, uh, signal in, which is what I've done here. Very small amount. I'm at 90-10. So 90% of this signal is the process signal. 10 is like that original mix uh, coming through. The last thing, though, that you're going to want to uh, really pay attention to is the output gain boost. So whatever the loose average of your compression is, so in my instance, it's around minus three on average. You'll see it jumps to like minus six, sometimes even minus seven if I'm getting really loud. But on average, it's around minus three. You want to increase the gain at the end of the compressor with that boost to bring that volume back because you want it to be the same volume going out as it was coming in more or less. And if you have the ability to, in your DAW, which is, I can't think of a DAW that you wouldn't, you can toggle the compressor on and off, like I could here if I wanted to, uh, and, uh, and listen to the volume level of the audio coming in, and then turn the compressor on, see if it's around the same volume, and that's what you're shooting for. You don't want it to be way louder or way quieter, you just want it to be about the same volume level, just now it's been... Uh, it has been compressed, and that's all there is to a compressor. I know that probably sounded a little bit more complicated than uh, than it is, but that's all there is to it. Now, in my next thing in my chain is a deesser, and this is another one of those things where it will change based on uh, what DAW you're using, what plugins you're using. Uh, but in general, a deesser is kind of it kind of sounds like what it does. It takes a little bit of the edge off of S sounds. So if I were to just output the S's only here so that you can hear what this de is uh, attenuating, which is, you know, reducing the volume of, is all that means, you can hear it. So one sec. That's all it is. It's doing that. Uh, there are many different methods of de -essing. You can even, honestly, and some people do this if they're very consistent with their own S's, because everyone's sibilance starts in different places or exists in different places. Um, usually it's somewhere between 4 and 8K 
If you're male or female vocal, it will change. For me, I am somewhere around uh, six to seven K. You can actually, if you wanted to, you can you can cut those frequencies in your equalizer and just do a really sharp Q like that or the high Q and listen for where your S's tend to fall and do your own like manual attenuation if you want. But more often than not, for a lot of people, if you have the ability to just run a de-esser of, uh, of some sort, that's the way to go. Uh, everyone's settings for their de will be a bit different, but the general idea is you're going to set somewhere the frequency that the de is looking to attenuate or look at. Sometimes it can be a band, uh, meaning a range of, uh, of frequencies. Uh, so for example, here I'll just I'll just show you another version of a deesser. I'll show you the stock deesser. In audition. I'll turn it off. Uh so for uh for this deesser, for example, um you'd be saying the threshold. Seen that word a lot. You know what threshold means at this point, right? You know that it means that it's only going to kick on once it is above wherever you set it. In this instance, it's minus 30 dB, which is not a bad place to set your DSing to start at because you don't want it to be too loud before it kicks in because then it's not really doing anything useful. So you can set your threshold and then you're going to set in this instance, like I said, sometimes it's a, a band or, or frequency range. Uh, the center frequency is 5,000, and the bandwidth is 3. So what does that mean? Well, it means the width of it is is 3K, but it's centering on, or 3,000 hertz, but it's centering on 5,000. And then in this instance, it's showing you the band here. So if I move this, you can see how the bandwidth changes, the center frequency changes, and that's all that means. And you don't want it to be too wide, because if you were to cut all that and, and lower that above minus 30, oh! Uh, be a bit aggressive. Definitely change the sound quite substantially. So you want to kind of just listen for your S's and get that frequency in there, but you don't want it to be too sharp because you'll have the opposite problem where you might not catch all of the S's uh, or you might sound, make it sound unnatural. So the stock settings of somewhere around 3000, um, you can go anywhere from the bandwidth of 2000 to 4000. Uh, that I've successfully used on on my voice over the years, depending on the microphone and the positioning, etc. Uh, and the center frequency, again, is going to depend on your own voice and where your S's lie. But odds are it will be somewhere between 4 and 8K the vast majority of the time. If your siblings is outside of that, which is possible, then you can just adjust for it. But otherwise, that's a, a pretty safe bet. Uh, and then you can just output your sibilants only a lot of the times on these de to hear what you're actually cutting out and how much it is reducing it. And that's what you'd see over here, for example. So if I did turn this on, now and I'm already de so this is going to be kind of awkward. So I turn this on and the center, for, center frequency was around... Six thousand... And I did a, if I, if I wake up long enough to do that, 2,000. So, there you go. Sibilance. <laughs> so there you go. So that's the gain reduction of just how much it's going to reduce uh, those S's is what that's all about there. Um, and, and just like with compression, unless it's really egregious... You don't want it to, to, to gain reduce more than maybe 5 dB at the absolute highest. If you go higher than that, it sounds really unnatural, and it probably just there sounded quite unnatural, uh, for example. Um, so just be mindful that you don't over-reduce those on your voice for that reason. The last thing in my chain, and certainly not something that everyone needs, and not everyone needs a de but uh, a limiter is what I have here at the end. And a limiter is very similar to a compressor um, in that it uh, it kind of sets a cutoff point of sorts for how loud you want things to be. And you can raise the volume of the rest of the waveform of your, your audio um, to help, squ you know, not squash, but to help, uh, to help uh, let's say, uh, even out your waveform and make things sound louder on average. Um... The difference is that instead of like, instead of pushing those peaks down, 
it's just going to cut those things right off, like a buzzsaw, right across. And so you've got to be careful because when you start cutting frequencies entirely, is that you can sometimes, once again, make things sound unnatural. So the idea of a limiter is to help, I guess, what I would call thicken the sound and make, again, everything sound a bit louder and then try and get the waveform to be a bit more uh, uniform. And I put it you're the last in the chain is almost always the last in most chains because you've done all of your processing and now you're just trying to shoot for making everything sound a bit louder and getting it ready for that final uh, that final output, right? So if I were to turn off this, then you can hear the difference, which is pretty substantial, right? Uh, I mean, that's a lot more quiet uh, and uh, not nearly as, as loud, really, uh, as, uh, as it is. It might sound roughly the same in terms of the the processing but the volume is dramatically changed if i turn it back on all of a sudden now here we are and that's for a number of reasons one i have the output volume turned up on it here a bit but uh, also just the nature of the limiter so the settings that you'll often see on a limiter uh, include uh, something like a, a ceiling or an or a peak or an absolute could be a number of different verbiage things there. That's more or less, well, if I hover here, thank you, Ozone, uh, it's saying it sets the maximum output level. So this is where that buzzsaw lives. Where, the, where this is set is if the volume were to go above that, we're just nipping that right off within the limiter. The threshold is just like it is anywhere else. This is where the limiter uh, begins to actually do its limiting. And if you were to move it, you know, up or down, it will, you will be able to uh, audibly hear what the, uh, you know, where it starts to really increase its, uh, uh, its volume. So for example, if I were to raise it, it actually can sometimes make it a bit quieter. And if I were to lower it back down and we go below six, then it will make it a bit louder. Uh, and for me, for this setup, minus six is about right. Um... Then from there, once you've set your threshold and your ceiling, what you can do to help uh, accomplish that more full, louder sound overall is you can increase the input volume uh, on the limiter. And that's just taking the signal coming into the limiter and boosting it uh, to help it get towards that threshold where the limiter kicks in and you're just trying to, uh, to find that sweet spot. For me, I boosted the input gain 3 dB to get the sound that I wanted and the volume that I wanted uh, and then that allowed the limiter to do its job and then on the other side of that I boosted the total output plus three and that's just to get for my live stream around the volume that you guys are hearing right now which, in, which ends up being somewhere around minus 12 to minus 10 uh, dB uh, which is where I like my vocal to sit for my purposes and that's all there is I say that even though I've been talking for 53 minutes now. My goodness, am I long-winded. <laughs> uh, and you can even see that uh, for my own, you know, I still peek it every now and then. And that's also because I, I have these settings for doing my reviews. It's not really set for uh, getting super loud. I'm not screaming during my reviews. Um, hopefully, to somebody, that was mildly useful somehow <laughs> i don't know how but somehow um it's it's a topic that is uh certainly complicated when you first get into it but then once you get the 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 core down then and you start to play around with things a, a, a little bit it just it just gets easier over time and the you know, if you were to only do, you know, a couple of things with your audio, if you're live streaming, uh, live streaming or, or doing uh, any other kind of work similar to that, whether it be content creation or your Zoom calls, etc. A noise gate, um, high pass filter, little bit of equalization, and a compressor. Those are like the core. You can do that. And if you only did like a couple of things, it would be a noise gate. And maybe a, a little bit of, of equalization with a high pass and whatnot. Um, um, unless you're somebody that just randomly screams. And then the compressor is necessary. Uh, yeah, that's, 
that's kind of uh, my little mini primer on this topic. Uh, there are so, so many videos that will do a much better job than I just did. But since people ask me specifically, I thought I would put this together and just give you my current experience, my current knowledge uh, of the topic uh, for, uh, for what I do personally. Uh, and hopefully that's useful. If you have questions, of course, feel free to ask them in the question uh, you know, in the comment section below. And the only other thing that I can think of that some people might uh, ask is, you know, once you've got your volume coming or your volume, your microphone audio going into the the DAW, you know, how do I um, how do I get it outputting to uh, OBS or if I'm not using OBS to do all of this uh, or Discord if I want the if I want people on Discord to hear this audio, well. Now that I've already changed screens, because I'm amazing, let me go uh, back over here. So for me, because I'm in a two PC setup, I'm sending this out to another channel on my interface to be sent over to the streaming PC. Uh, but for uh, for a single PC environment where you're sending it to Discord or or whatnot, uh, if you're not using OBS as your as your VST host, your DAW, what you want to do is you want to download some sort of virtual audio cable. VB audio cable is the one that I use and would recommend. It's free. You install that, and it just acts as another uh, another output that will be registered as a microphone or input in other software. So you'd go in here, and you'd select you know stereo, and you'd select the VB audio uh, virtual audio cable, and then in whatever program you're using, whether it's OBS or Discord or Zoom or what uh, what have you, you would choose that VB audio as your microphone input. And then all the stuff that you're doing here in your DAW will get sent to that program and they'll hear the processed audio. And that's it. Now it's really it. That's really the, the show. Once again, you've got questions. Comment section below. If I missed a bunch of stuff that you were hoping that I would talk about, I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to answer it. I'll also do my best to have, you know, labeled these sections in the video for people to, to skip through to what they might need to know. Um, and, uh, and definitely do your best, if you're really serious about this, to explore YouTube and, uh, and the interwebs for lots of people's opinions and, and takes on, on this exact topic. And just try and learn as much as you can, and uh, and then with your situation, you'll you'll get there, and you'll have much better sounding audio. I believe in you. You can do it. Hit the subscribe button, the bell icon, if you want more videos. If you want me to do other tutorial type stuff, and you think I might have even the slightest idea of what I'm talking about for those topics, let me know, and I'll consider doing them in the future. Otherwise, thank you so much for stopping by. All of my socials again in the description. All the usual YouTuber stuff, you know how to do it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, peace! <laughs>